I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Hertfordshire looking at disability inclusion in archaeology with a focus on the workplace and chronic illness. I have a background in archaeology. I was um, a community archaeologist, a commercial archaeologist, and I've worked in the HER and historic um, and heritage management as well. So one note is that I do stumble over my words sometimes. It's part of my disability and chronic illness, the sort of brain fog aspect of it. So that's something just to be, um, to uh, remember. And I will be looking at notes as well from time to time. So as well as my doctorate and my part-time work now as a community heritage officer, I sit on the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists Advisory Council and EDI Committee the Historic Environment Scotland Steering Group for their Inclusive Workplace Project. I'm in the Networking and Communications Officer for the Enabled Archaeology Foundation, and I sit on the ARA Diversity Allies Group as well. So I just wanted to talk today about some of the barriers at the different stages of recruitment and in the workplace, so retention, and looking at inclusive employment practices and the benefits of employing disabled people. So a little bit about my doctoral work, it's entitled Breaking Down Barriers, Disability Inclusion and Archaeology. So I look at the barriers at different stages of the recruitment process, so the advertisement through to the interview and onboarding and retention as well. So it's looking at career progression as well. Um, there's many archaeologists that are overqualified but stagnate in lower level roles or leave the sector it's harder to get those higher level opportunities and that leads on to part-time work. It's harder to get those higher level opportunities at the part-time hours they're often full-time. This also uh, the lack of flexible opportunities and there was a gap uh, in the research around chronic illness. So if we talk about some of the barriers and understanding those. So Phillips and Gilchrist noted that there was an attitude of having a disposable workforce. And it's also uh, linked to those short-term contracts as well. They also said that archaeology is often seen as the preserve of young, fit and healthy people. So where do some disabled archaeologists fit there? Um, if those bodies don't fit that norm, there's a lack of part-time work and higher level positions, as I alluded to before with the flexible working opportunities, and also where there's intersectionalities with um, race or gender, for example. There's a lack of understanding from both employers and colleagues at times. Um, disclosure as well. People will only disclose if they feel there's a comfortable environment and be able to get that support that they need. It's about um, where reasonable adjustments are given, that their meaningful roles with clear career progression and communication can be a barrier. So it's using those inclusive language and continuous training about that because it is something that's ever changing. We have unconscious bias as well, where we have hidden prejudices that affect how we see and treat others and we need to become aware of those. So, uh, Kath Poucher recently did a study for Historic England, and this is a quote from there. Um, I was one of the people that were interviewed for this project, and she said, when we asked if they thought that the industry was a good place to work if you are dis disabled, everyone we spoke to said no. So that was all the archaeologists in there said it wasn't a good place to work if you have a disability. So hopefully that is something that we can all change. So how do we become more sustainable as a sector? Well, I would argue that this is by utilising inclusive employment practices. So these are things like providing different application formats. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's providing other alternatives to traditional uh, application forms. So whether that's a video, um, it could be anything. Um, you could either offer 
it's good practice to offer those options or listen to uh, people asking you um, if they can do something different as well. It's if you are going to have a traditional interview, then uh, reimbursing those interview costs. Some people aren't doing interviews now, they're providing work trials and also offering an online option where that's possible. It's about providing questions beforehand, which is good practice now to offer to everyone and many companies are doing that. It's providing those different entry routes because um, traditionally it seems that people would go in uh, into the sector through excavation and making their way to those desk-based jobs, whereas lots of um, disabled people cannot go and do the excavation work. So we need to provide opportunities where those people can go into desk-based jobs if that's what they want to do. Um, you could also uh, do blind censoring on CVs as well. So that's where you redact uh, information on disability, race and gender. So it's trying to remove that unconscious bias or minimize it. And Gap analysis was developed by a company called AbilityNet, and you can look that up. And you can assess where you are as an organisation and a person at the moment and see where you want to move to and work at that. So it's about getting those training for managers and anybody involved in the recruitment process to be up to date and to have a good understanding of disability awareness. Giving staff CPD, that's important um, for them to feel included and valued by the company. Using inclusive language, having regular training on that as it does change as well. Um, and then what adjustments can you make and what do those look like? So adjustments are very individual to the person. So it's a conversation um, to be had on an individual basis. Disabilities can be comorbid often, so that's where uh, several disabilities may exist at the same time for one person. And it's about knowing about the schemes like access to work. How can people access that? It's the person that access that when they're in work and they can get money to help with um, anything that they need as part of an adjustment. So what might those adjustments look like? So it could be for a physical ability, a physical disability, that could look like providing an ergonomic chair or a ramp. It could look like assistive technology for neurodiversity. It could be limiting driving time for chronic illness or split up breaks or working from home. That has been a big benefit of uh, the pandemic where we know now that we can work from home in many cases. And for mental health, it could look like having a mentor in the company, somebody that it could go to. So there I am on the right hand side of the screen there. So I have a sit stand desk, an anti fatigue mat, an adjustable foot rest, and an ergonomic mouse. And my screen is tilted as well. It could look like to the right there, uh, where I have a chair, just I can sit down if I need to. And on average, a reasonable adjustment costs between 75 to 250 pounds, according to Jane Hatton, who we'll hear more about later. Some people won't require any adjustments and many of the adjustments will be free or low cost. So what do inclusive employers do as part of this um, the, uh, process? So a phase one, I just did this uh, model to make it easier to break up these five stages. So advertisement. So it's looking at the training uh, for managers and people in HR using inclusive language and being proactive in offering alternatives. Stage two, looking at interviews or even work trials instead of interview. Beforehand, it's offering those questions. It, it's explaining the format of the interview. During the interview, it's allowing notes and note taking. Step three is the onboarding. 
It's given a thorough induction, having regular team meetings and feedback. And the social aspect is that if that's important to the person, then it's having those opportunities for that. The fourth step is the training for everybody and the CPD for um, employees as well is offering those opportunities and making suggestions. So if you've seen something that the employee is really interested in, uh, sharing that will make them feel valued as well. So retention. Step five, it's fostering that inclusive atmosphere continually. It's educating the rest of the workforce as well. If somebody has been off sick, it's being aware of things like phase returns and then being aware about schemes such as access to work to access funding for these things. So why should we become more inclusive and therefore more sustainable as a sector? Well, I would argue that there are so many benefits to employing disabled people. So it's attracting the right person for the job. It's the disabled people on average have less time off sick, that they're just as productive. And they avoid this idea of group think. It's a phenomenon where uh, a group who want to reach a consensus and it, it can lead to a rational outcome and affects creativity. Whereas if we diversify the group of people, it can avoid having this group think with different ideas uh, being added into the mix. So disabled people are often very innovative. They um, are used to looking at things in a different way and finding resolutions to things. Often it can attract funders if you are an inclusive employer. For example, the National Lottery uh, Heritage Fund look for diverse audience audience participation. Um, also, if you have a good reputation for inclusion, that can attract candidates and customers as well. It's been proven to raise the morale of all employees if you're an inclusive employer and employ disabled people. And also the purple pound is the spending power that disabled people have. Businesses lose two billion pounds a month by ignoring the needs of disabled people. If you are employing disabled people, they they can often spot these gaps in what consumers want. So it's a benefit to everybody uh, intersectionally as well. What will help a disabled person will often help uh, somebody else as well. It's a benefit to everybody in the future. We don't know when we may acquire a disability at any point in life. And also disabled people on average tend to stay in a job longer, therefore reducing those costs of retraining people. So there are, we can see there are lots of benefits in employing disabled people. So um, this is a quote from the Accenture study. Uh, companies that embrace best practices for employing and supporting more disabled people in their workforce have outperformed their peers. So that's also monetary, it's 28% higher revenue, double net income, and 30% higher economic profit margins. So there is the financial value to employing disabled people. So through identifying and removing the barriers disabled candidates face, your organisation will attract and retain unimaginable talent. That's a quote from Jane Hutton, who's done a lot of research into um, disability inclusion. So really, we come on to then, can you afford not to do this? Can you afford not to remove those barriers that society has put in place? Can you afford not to reap the benefits of employing disabled people and making things better for everybody? So thank you for listening to my talk today. Uh, please do get in touch if you've got any questions, either through Twitter or my email. And thank you very much for coming to the session today. I hope you have a great conference.